Well, it's nice to be here again. Um, try to be here every year. My name's Matt Brady with Utah Retirement System. And we're going to review the Tier 1 non-contributory system. Right? So are, are all of you folks part of Tier 1? I guess the quick clarification is that legislation changed as of July 2011. So anybody in public employment with benefits prior to July 1st of 2011 is grandfathered into what we now call Tier 1, right? Anyone new since then is Tier 2. So we'll just dive right in. Now, we, I do encourage questions, especially from a small group, right? You, you shouldn't be too hard to manage. <laughs> too many questions. We'll see, huh? We'll see. So I, I think today we'll start out, um, for those who are actually closer to retirement, you know, what are a few things to be considering here? First of all, know that we retire on the 1st or the 16th of a given month following your last day worked. So uh, here's a quick example. Um, you know, a lot of people like to retire at the end of the year or January 1st, right? So if your last day of employment is toward the end of December and you want to use January 1st as your retirement date, don't work on January 1st. Otherwise, we're going to push you to January 16th. It's just, just a line in the sand, right? Or if you think about our, our school districts, um, popular time to retire is in June once school is out. So here at Box Elder School District, if the last day of school is June 3rd, for example, um, you can use June 16th as your retirement date. We are looking at your last day worked. Um, as far as individual, one-on-one, -on -one personal advice, whether you are brand new on the job or retiring next week, this is a service available to everybody. I am somewhere in Box Elder County every month. And um, the, the county itself is part of the rotation. I'm at Box Elder School District. I'll be here. I'll be at Brigham City. And uh, those are the three main locations that, uh, that you'll find me at. To register for an individual session, you log into your URS account and uh, click on that Education tab. Under Education, you'll find seminars, a few types of seminars. But that's where you'll find the individual retirement planning options. And uh, I know the frustrating thing is when I come to town, the the appointments fill up really fast. I'm in Cache County every month. I'm in Box Elder County every month. I'm in Tooele every month. I'm in Salt Lake every month. Um, if you struggle to get an appointment or, or you struggle to find an open appointment, if you're willing to come to Salt Lake, every business day of the year, we have individual sessions. Um, I guess that's, you know, we have one or two reps every day um, available for individual sessions at our office. When it comes to health insurance, when you're leading into retirement and thinking about, well, what am I going to do for health insurance? You know, most employers don't carry insurance benefits into retirement. This is an employer-specific question. Or you're talking to Medicare, right? Medicare, which is available at 65 and later. So I, I'm not the person to talk to about health insurance. Um, in the three years leading up to retirement, two or three years from retirement, that's when our pension department is quite happy to generate an estimate for you. They'll, they'll run up a quote for your pension, for your situation. They're likely to come in on the conservative side because if you're two or three years away and probably going to get two, three, four percent raises over the next couple of years, but I'm ching, right? <laughs> um, the pension department is not accounting for raises over the next couple of years. They're going to generate a quote based on the highest years of salary you've had so far, right? Um, there's the phone number, 801 366 7770, if you have any questions for the pension department directly. In the six months leading up to retirement, be sure you know where your proof of age documents are. That could be your birth certificate, um, a marriage license for those who are married, 
um, and a few other documents that we could use as alternatives. I've just seen too many of our members think, well, yeah, I know right where those documents are. They're in the cedar chest in, in the living room, right? I, they've been there for decades. Well, double check, right? Some people have, have gone to get those documents right before they're retiring and they're not there. And then you've got that hassle of, of getting duplicates and it could slow things down. So just double check. And the ball really gets rolling. The fun starts to happen up to 90 days ahead of your last day work. That's when you could actually start that application process. You can fill out the paperwork up to 90 days ahead of time or up to 90 days after the fact. Right? If we pick on you for a moment, what's your name? Cody. 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 I've talked to Cody before. So if Cody has a sudden retirement, for whatever reason, people take you off or you get laid off, whatever. If it's a sudden retirement, just for the example, what's the date today? I don't even know. The 12th? Yeah. December 12th? So if somebody quits today and they want to use December 16th, you're too young, um, they have until January, February, March 16th to still use December 16th as a retirement date and receive retroactive pension checks to December 16th. Okay. So up to three months ahead of time or up to three months after the fact. Thanks for playing, Cody. I'm not done picking on you. Um, and we're going to talk about this in a little while, but it, it also says on the screen that in those three months, that's when you would take care of any future service purchase buying out a couple of years that you're not working, right? We'll expand on that. But uh, a future service purchase is taken care of in the last two weeks, the last 15 days of your career, if, if that applies to you. So hopefully this looks familiar. Every March, we either mail out or send an email to you saying, hey, here's your annual statement or your annual pension statement is available now. And, and I always like to review three pieces of information we find on that annual statement. Anyone care to guess what I'm getting to? Beneficiaries are crucial, right? We remind you at least annually who you have designated as primary, secondary, contingent beneficiaries. What else? Years of service. Total years of service in our system. That's kind of important, right? And salary. We list calendar year salary that has been reported to us for your entire career. Retirement eligible salary. Um, why, are, why is it important to double check these things? Well, sometimes salary, sometimes it's um, reported inaccurately. It's not as common as it used to be. Our employers are really trained well and, and know what they're doing. But it's your chance to make sure the records are accurate. Make sure those years of service are, are what you think they should be. Or make sure uh, that they are accruing, right? And again, the beneficiaries, we'll, we'll come back to that. So be engaged in the benefit. Look at that annual statement every year. Let's review that formula, the basic math we have under the tier one system. And this is in that pension basics brochure if you're a note taker. Okay, it's on that first page. So we kind of like that 2% multiplier. Every year we put in into public employment is worth 2%. That makes the math pretty easy. If I work 20 years, I, I have a 40% benefit. All right, if I go 40 and a half years, I'm sorry, if I go 20 and a half years, I have what? A 41% benefit. Multiply it by two. Partial years count. All right? So we're earning a percentage of what? <clears throat> a final average salary. Our highest three years averaged out. Are they your last three years? Maybe, maybe not. Not necessarily, right? If your last three years are those highest, that's what we'll use. If someone's retiring today and their highest years so far are 2016, 2014, and 2010, that's what we'll use. We'll average those together. Right. Any questions on, on that basic formula? When it comes to the final average salary, we are looking at your gross income before all deductions, before taxes, all of that. Why? Because your pension check is subject to income tax. Right, right now, your current paychecks 
are subject to income tax, federal and state, and FICA, right? You have Medicare and Social Security tax, and then other deductions. In retirement, speaking for your pension, for your 401k, plan on paying income tax only at a federal and state level. Your state income tax on these benefits depends on your primary residence in retirement. So here's the example that we have used for at least a decade, ever since I started like 12 years ago. So a 30-year career at 2% each replaces 60%, right? So in this example, if, that, if this member is averaging, has averaged uh, $40,000, they have a $26,000, $24,000 annual pension. Divide it up into 12 monthly checks, right? Pretty simple. This person has $2,000 a month for how long? How long are we going to send a pension check to this retiring member? Till they die, possibly for longer, we're going to review uh, the different payout options, right? So pretty straightforward. Um, I'll just bring it up. If you look at the fine text here, there's a little asterisk that, that says, hey, for those of you who started before 1989, what was it that changed in January of 1989 that, that may affect your benefit? Well, before 1989, we were just talking about taxes, right? Our pension checks were only subject to federal tax. They were state tax free. It must have been nice, right? But the laws changed as of January of 89, probably because other people were bothered at this state tax free benefit that we had, right? Think about maybe um, federal employees in Utah who have similar benefits, but they, they were paying both types of taxes. So what am I getting at? Those who were in the system under the old law before 1989 may get basically a COLA up front, a cost of living increase on the entire benefit of 3% right from the get-go to make up for the change in, in the uh, tax laws. So I like to bring up here well, Matt, you said might. We might get that 3%. I started in 1987. Am I going to get the 3% or not? Um, those who have time in the contributory system pre-1986, when members were contributing to the pensions, right, it was required. Um, if you terminate your employment, you can take your contributions back out of the pension. And that would well, it would eliminate those years of service toward a pension. If you came back later, that's, that's a situation where you would not get that 3%. I don't know that I explained that very well, but if you took out any of your member contributions that you would only have usually if you were in the system before 1986, then you may not get that 3% COLA right from the get-go. Um, if you want to know for sure if you're going to get the 3%, then just call up the pension department. They'll tell you over the phone. But uh, one more moment on the 3%. Um, you'll see that example where this is a $2,000 monthly benefit in this example. If they're getting the 3%, it's the $2,000 times 1.03, which brings them the, to $2,060. It's not a 63% benefit. In this example, it's a 3% increase to the dollar benefit itself, all right? So when do we qualify to retire? We are all vested with at least four years, right? As long as we get four years in, we get something when we're, uh, when we're at least age 65, right? 65 with four. Do the four years need to be with the same participating employer? They don't have to be, right? Maybe you started at Corinne City and you came to Box Elder County. Maybe you'll end up at Brigham City. Maybe you'll move to Kanab and teach school in Kane School District. They're all a part of the same system. We're just going to add your years of service together. So the magic numbers, so to speak, are age 65 or 30 years of service. Why do we like 65 or 30 years of service? Anybody recall? 
Because it's what? I'm sorry. Because you, because we're mean. Because yeah. <laughs> we won't let you retire younger, yeah. with fewer than 30 years. Well, we will. It's the 30-year mark or age 65 that give you full retirement, or in other words, the full 2% for every year that you put in. Right? There's, there is some middle ground. You could retire at any age with 25 years of service, but that age matters. There's an early age reduction that applies. You could retire as early as age 60 if you have at least 20 years, as early as age 62 with at least 10 years. For the full 2% for all of your years, if you collect at 65 or later, or at the 30 years, that's, that's when you'll get the full 2%. Otherwise, you're subject to this early age reduction. Um, we shave off 3% per year in your 60s. It starts to sting for the years below age 60. So let's do this in an example. A 57-year-old with 25 years of service. This is a pretty common scenario. And a lot of people get excited. Oh, any age with 25 years. Great, I'll go out at 25 years. Well, think twice. A 57-year-old, and let's start at 65 and count down, right? 65 down to 60 is five years. So that'd be five years at 3% each. There's 15%. 59, 58, 57. There's another three years at 7% each for another 21. That's a 36% decrease on the benefit for retiring young and not having the 30 years, right? So maybe that's where Cody's saying we're mean, right? OK, so Cody's fine. <laughs> 30 years at 51. So that won't apply, right? The early age reduction won't apply. Yeah, any age at 30, no reduction. Any age. If you retire at age. No, no, you're good. Any age with 30 years. So the caveat, the line in the sand is you have to have 30 years. 30 years, age 65, whatever comes first. So what if he wants to retire at 46, five years early? So if he retires at 46 with 25 years of service in, what are his options? He did an early buyout, and then this doesn't apply. He could buy his last five years. And then this doesn't apply. This doesn't apply. You either work to the 30, buy to the 30, or accept the early age reduction. Now, can you also delay? Let's do a different scenario. One question real quick. Sure. In your experience, financially, it would make more sense between if you have the money to buy out, between buying out and taking the penalty if you're talking about being in your 50s. So um, rephrasing that question, if you're in your 50s, say you have 25 years in, you're done. You want to go do something else. Um, you're asking, does it make sense? Right? Well, if you're asking and you have the money, right? So we'll pick on Cody again. Cody's, let's say Cody's 49. And he's what, two years away, three years away from hitting his 30 years. If he retires and collects with his 27 years of service, his early age reduction is more than 50%. Financially, if he has the money to buy those last couple of years, the return on his investment, he makes up for that in just a matter of a couple of years. That one's a no-brainer where you're so young, if you have the money to, to make the purchase. It really is a case-by-case -case situation. This is one of those scenarios where we love to sit down with you, crunch the numbers, and see what makes sense for you. Is it feasible? Is it not? If it's a 50, if it's a 58-year-old retiring with 27 years in, they're just done. They have a pretty big early age reduction. They could just work up two, and at 60, it's not so bad early age reduction. Or if they're done working, I would say if you can afford it, fine, be done working, but postpone starting the pension at least till. When it's a 15% reduction, that's not so bad, honestly, compared to having any of those years in your 50s. So along those lines, uh, when you decide to take your pension, you get the options. Can you use the money for a buy like the first time you buy it? Like, 
Oh, yeah. No. <laughs> no. Well, hold that thought for a moment. Let's show them that option. Well, yeah, let's show them those options and then come back to that question. The takeaway here is make sure you understand how the early age reduction works. It applies if you're retiring under the age of 65 and don't have the 30 years, right? So here's our Captain Obvious slide. How do you boost your benefit? Well, you either work longer, you earn more money, or you maybe make a service purchase. So we were just alluding to a future service purchase, right? Buying time, you don't have to work. The quick rules on this one are, you need to have 25 years at least to buy any, or be age 65 with at least five years in. Well, Matt, at 65, you don't have an early age reduction. Can you still buy years? Sure. You can, you know, what's the benefit of buying five years in the pension? Mathematically, what do five years give you? At least another 2% per year, right? There's 10%. In most cases, it helps you avoid an early age reduction, but I've seen people with 35, 40 years in still buying five years, just boosting that pension, right? They love the, they love the security of the pension, and they probably think they're going to live a long time, right? It's an investment. So you can, you can make a service purchase, a future service purchase with a 25 in or be age 65. And again, that purchase is made at the time of retirement. You know, if I'm at 25 years now, I can't buy five years now and keep working. I have to retire, right? Compared to the really broad category, the second bullet point here of just a plain old service purchase, what is that? Well, that is buying time usually in a similar system, public service, elsewhere. Maybe I lived in Colorado and taught school for seven years, and I came to Utah, and I put in 23 years. I have 30 years between the two, but it's two different states, right? Seven years in Colorado could be a service purchase. I could buy the seven years there, have them count here, and now I have 30 in Utah and I can retire. That's the general idea, right? A service purchase in general is buying time that you have accrued elsewhere. That could be military, federal, public service in a different state. Um, but you're forfeiting the benefit elsewhere to have it count here. This type of service purchase can be made any time in your career as long as you are vested. And the military time that, that some people can buy, that's the only type of service that can count in both places. If I had some full-time US active military time and I have a military benefit, I could buy some or all of that, have it count in Utah, and it would not reduce what I have in the military. Just a little food for thought there. Reinstating withdrawn contributions is less common. This would be paying back any withdrawn uh, amounts that you've taken out of your pension. Again, usually pre-1986. You could redeposit. You could pay back what you might have taken out in your pension and get that time back. So this is a broad category. If you want to talk about this in more detail or look at your specific situation, give us a call at that pension department or sign up for a one-on-one. -on -one. But if we get back to the flow of, hey, I've been, I'm earning a pension, I'm approaching retirement, here is uh, one of the big decisions that you'll have in retirement. Which monthly payout option do you want? The basic math in the formula is option one. The maximum amount that you have in the formula is option one. It's for your life only. Let's review a couple of other options that uh, could go on past your lifetime, right? And uh, there's a definition there for each of them, but I'm going to teach it using a, the same example of a 30-year career, someone whose final average salary is 40 grand, and we're even going to show how age can play into this. All right? So remember, this was a $2,000 monthly benefit. 
which is option one. What is option one? It's good for your own lifetime, right? You'll see that there's no spouse or beneficiary benefit after you pass away with option one, right? Well, then what is option two? Option two is pretty rare. It only applies to those who have time in the contributory system, usually pre-1986. If you have member contributions toward your own pension, you could take option two. In this case, it's $100 less per month. And what? What happens after you die? It says any beneficiary would receive the remaining contributory account balance. Those are those member contributions toward your own pension. Now, what do we do with that balance? Well, as soon as you retire, a little bit of every monthly check comes from your contributory account balance. So we're whittling away at that. You would only take option two if, um, if you have a pretty large contributory account balance, and honestly, if you have a life expectancy of maybe less than a decade. Again, it's a rare option. For some of our members, it makes a lot of sense. Most of you can ignore option two. That leads to three, four, five, and six. This is, a, this is a sensitive part of these options for some of our members, right? Because who can inherit a monthly pension check? Anybody know? It's, it's your legal spouse at the time of retirement if you choose three, four, five, or six, and then if that spouse outlives you, right? So there's a lot of ifs in there. Again, it's legal spouse at the time of retirement. So death or divorce later on, getting remarried, you know, that there are some repercussions here, which maybe we'll review. But let's look at option three. Instead of $2,000 a month, option three would provide $1,764 per month. If the member passes away before the spouse, what happens? The spouse continues to get the same check. Option three is a 100% spousal benefit, and it, it ensures you get the same check until you've both passed away, right? That's option three. And by the way, this is a retiring member at age 62 with 30 years in. Do you remember how old the spouse is? Spouse is 60 in this example. They're practically the same age. It's that joint life expectancy that determines the amount of the decrease for each option. In other words, if this 62-year-old spouse has a 42-year-old, I'm sorry, 62-year-old retiring member has a 40-year-old spouse, there's a larger age gap, option three might be $1,400 a month, right? Providing an ongoing check for that much younger spouse. Joint life expectancy plays into this. So we're good with option three. Option four is a larger monthly benefit than option three. It's not as much of a reduction, but the spouse would only get half. Right? So while the member's around with the spouse, it's, it's more than option three, but the spouse would only inherit half. That's usually popular for couples who really don't need each other's money. Maybe they both have great retirement benefits. Then we have five and six. Five and six are similar to three and four. Five and six are a little bit less than three and four. What's the big difference? You see it in the text. If you choose five or six and your spouse passes away before you, your benefit goes back up to option one for the rest of your life, right? So in option three, you could take $17.64 per month. You'll get that until you've both passed away. Option five in this example is $25 less per month. If the retired member outlives the spouse, the retired member's benefit goes back up to option one. Slight difference. If you have a crystal ball, this is an easy decision, right? This is a big decision, and, and if you really think about it, uh, depending on your situation at retirement, one, of, one or two of these might fit you best. Any thoughts or any, any comments on this, sir? So let's take Cody's situation again. Picking on Cody. Now, I mean, if he's eligible at 51 and he can buy out five years, then he and his wife at 46, so that means those options three through six would be significantly 
Oh, I see where you're. OK, so, and what's your name? Scott. Setting up this scenario, right? Well, if at age 46, I'm buying my last five years to get up to 30. Well, my wife and I are in our 40s. Is that a huge early age reduction? Or, or is option three, four, five, or six going to be reduced big time because they're so young? That's the question, right? We're looking at your age or Scott or uh, Cody's age compared to his wife. Okay. It's not so, ma so much the fact that, wow, they're 20 years younger than most retirees. It's what's the age difference between the two of them? Right. Yep. The 30 years eliminates the early age reduction. Considering three, four, five, and six, that's comparing ages to each other. Yep. Yep. Very good question. Did we all understand that one? Good question. Any other? Any other clarification we can? Crystal ball. <laughs> if I knew, I wouldn't be standing here, right? <laughs> But, but let's go through an example or two. Um, you know, if, if I'm retiring and, and my wife is younger, healthier, better looking, and nobody, nobody on my side, of, but nobody on my side of the family lives past 75 and, and everybody on her side of the family lives into their 90s, I'd probably take an option three, right? Or, or put another way, if I'm dying of cancer at retirement, and, and highly likely to die before my spouse, I'm going to take option three instead of an option five, right? Option three is the largest spousal benefit that you can leave behind. On the flip side of that, let's, let's think of a, and, and I only bring up gender because statistically women outlive men, right? So if, if, um, if we have a retiring woman whose husband's a good seven years older than her, and he's not so healthy. She's, she's definitely looking at options five or six that would go back up to one at his passing, right? We're all in a different situation. If I'm single at retirement, I have option one, maybe option two, and really that, that's it, unless we look at the next two columns, right? So let's move on from this. Remember, this is the decision at retirement. Along with one through six, you also have two different partial cash out amounts available, right? You can get a chunk of this early and still have a monthly pension, but it's reduced in the long run, right? So you could get a year of your pension checks up front or two years up front. So here's kind of that full spectrum. Again, this $2,000 example is just that. It's just an example. This was 30 years, $40,000, right? So this member could take option, let's go with option five, and they could get $24,000 up front. So what is option five now if they take that 12-month PLSO, partial lump sum option? What's the monthly amount? 16, 17 per month, right? So they started at 2,000, but they like option five, and they want a chunk of money up front, their monthly check is sixteen seventeen per month, right? So that, that's part of the trade-off. We'll give this person $48,000 up front. If they like option three, well, now they're down almost $500 a month. But they have a spousal benefit in place. There's that peace of mind. And they're getting $48,000 up front. Pros and cons to this, right? What, what are the cons or the potential uh, negatives about taking a little more up front and less in the long run with a partial lump sum option. What are your thoughts? Remember, it's all taxable, right? The lump sums, the monthly checks are all taxable in the calendar year you receive them, right? So here we are in December. If I, let's say I retired November 16th, and I am going to take a partial lump sum option. I have almost a whole year of earned income already. Uncle Sam's going to love me if I take a large lump sum up front. Right. Well, what's, what's a good reason for taking a lump sum? I'll answer that. Um, well, 
Perfect. <laughs> sure. <laughs> yes, crystal ball. Well, that's a very good point. Some of our members can't retire, or they can't retire with enough peace of mind because they have this chunk of debt, right? And if, if they consider the tax ramifications and all of that, maybe it makes sense to pay off that house or pay off that debt so they can now retire, right? I do see some of our members using a partial lump sum option to pay off debt. Here's a no-brainer. And um, this is an example I've used for a couple of years now. I met with a single mother, age 58, about four years ago, retiring with her 30 years. Again, single mother. She was also dying. She had already outlived her doctor's expectations. We sat down together. I estimated her option one, because she's single, right? She says, Matt, what should I do? Option one really has three options, right? The single life annuity, the smaller single life annuity with a cash out, an even smaller single life annuity with a larger cash out. Well, she was dying. I recommended she take the 24 months. I highly recommended. I demanded <laughs> that she take the 24-month partial lump sum option, enjoy her money while she could. In fact, I recommended she move it directly into her 401k so it's not taxed all in one calendar year. Right? What, what else does that do for her if she's moved part of her pension to her 401k? Who can inherit that 401k? Her beneficiaries, her beneficiaries which were her children. She did die about, mm, it was less than two years later. She only enjoyed her pension for less than two years. She had money left over in her 401k that her kids inherited, right? Sad story, but that's a no-brainer, right? Definitely take the lump sum if you're single with a low life expectancy. If you're married and one of you is likely, highly likely to live into your 90s, even upper 80s, whatever, the math of it is don't take the lump sum in that case, right? A number from the first column in the long run is going to be a, a better benefit than taking a cash out up front. That's the mathematics of it. But again, we're all in a different situation. Right, thank you. Thank you for asking. So what, where are we getting the 24 and the 48? And what, what do the 12 and the 24 months mean, right? Um, the partial lump sum option is 12 months of option one. It's option one times 12, or option one times 24. Yep. You know, Cody, Cody might take option three or five, but his partial lump sum amount will be based on option one, multiplied by 12 or multiplied by 24. Thank you for asking that, yep. So potentially 18 different monthly amounts to consider, but that's, that's overwhelming to think of it that way. Look at one through six, look at your situation, and then whether or not you need a cash out up front or want a cash out up front. Um, my warning on the PLSO, the partial lump sum option, is that it's, it's a popular sales pitch for our members if, if you're using you know, an investment advisor outside of URS, they all want you to take the lump sum, right or wrong. Why do they want you to take the lump sum? They'll tell everybody to take it. Yeah, because you'll roll that lump sum into an account with them. They might do really well for you, but they're going to earn their cut too, right? So that may or may not be a wise investment. That's where you look at their fees and their history. Um, it's just a, it's a popular sales pitch. I'm just going to leave it at that. Not everybody should take the partial lump sum option. We're not going to, I guess that's a blanket statement. But you'll never hear us make the blanket statement, you would all be dumb if you didn't take a lump sum, right? So 
big decision. Look at your situation in retirement. It is a permanent decision. Um, we'll get to your original question in a moment. How are we doing on time? I don't even know what time we started. Oh, yeah, we're good. Okay. So, um, lost my train of thought. Divorce. Divorce. How does divorce affect this? Well, first of all, if you've been through a divorce before you get retired, before you retire, that divorce decree, the court order, is pretty important. Right? Utah is, I think they call it a 50-50 state as far as this goes, right? There's this Woodward formula that states, hey, if you get a divorce and you've been together for 10 years of your career, you're entitled to a pension. Well, that spouse is likely to get half of the value of the eventual pension for that 10-year span. Right? We're eventually going to calculate half of the value of the pension earned during the marriage. That's if you're divorced after you retire or before you retire? That's if you're divorced um, before you retire or even after. The, the takeaway here is um, a court order is the only thing that can override the law that I'm about to tell you. The law is, this is for your legal spouse at the time of retirement, right? So if you take option three, you retire, you're together 24 hours a day, you're not used to that, that leads to a divorce. I'm trying not to be funny here. That leads to divorce. It's common, right? There's more to think about leading into retirement, like how are we going to adjust? How are we going to transition and stay happy and, and do all of that? Um, but if you get divorced during retirement, you remarry eventually. You pass away before both of these former spouses. Who's getting option three? It's that legal spouse at the time of retirement. That it's the ex in this case, depending on the divorce decree. Okay. The takeaway is if you've been through a divorce or if you go through a divorce, give us a call. Call the pension department. Let's figure out what's going to happen. Let's help you. If you're, you're heading into a divorce, give us a call now so that we can give you some tools, give you and your attorney some tools. We'll talk about that Woodward formula. How do you craft an appropriate domestic relations order? I've just seen a lot of mistakes here, a lot of heartache. My own sister-in-law went Oh, uh, well, this is being recorded, right? My own sister-in-law went through a divorce a few years ago. And me being in the industry, I eventually, I just asked her, I said, hey, have you, have you and what's his name discussed the domestic relations order? Have you talked about his retirement and how much you're going to get out of this? Because she was a stay-at-home mom, right? She said, no, I hadn't even thought of that. And he was keeping pretty quiet about it. Um, it happens too often. If you go through a divorce, retirement benefits are one of the categories you have to tackle, right? Anyway, a lot of opinions there. Your question, Cody, a few minutes ago was, if I'm going to buy out my last few years of service, can I use the partial lump sum option to fund that purchase? And I gave you my no, right? Or yes, no, whatever. Chronologically, you have to pay for the service, pay for the time before you're ever collecting any money, right? So can you fund a service purchase from elsewhere, maybe your 401k or a loan, take the lump sum and repay that original source? That's the roundabout way of using a partial lump sum option to fund a service purchase. But remember that that is a taxable event in that case. Um, yeah. So so getting getting back to the idea of a service purchase, most people use their 401k or a, an IRA, a 457 plan, a tax deferred retirement account to buy time into their pension, because that is not a taxable event, right? You can transfer. <coughs> or roll over 401k money into your pension, use your 401k to buy your, your time, the pension will be taxed, not that 401k transfer. Okay. 
it, it's another incentive to maybe save for retirement if you're thinking, well, yeah, I might buy out my last two years. So let's keep rolling. I've spent a little bit of time on that. You know, we have online calculators uh, that have improved over the years. Uh, the pension calculator alone allows you to look at your own numbers. You can use this as a planning tool. A couple of key um, pieces of, of advice when you use the pension calculator. Um, the farther you are from retirement, the more you want to adjust for inflation, right? You're like 22 years old, huh? So if she's retiring in 40 years, does it do any good for her not to adjust for inflation? You know, the math for her, if she accounts for raises and all of that, it might be a $12,000 monthly pension check, which sounds pretty good today. But what will that buy in 40 years, right? A sandwich. <laughs> Bowling night. Yeah. <laughs> because of inflation, right? These days, we adjust for 2.5% inflation. When we calculate a pension that's, that's more than one year in the distance, just for inflation. And uh, don't overlook the retirement system. The calculator's for all of our members. You might be tier two, you might be a tier one police officer. Select the appropriate retirement system in the drop down menu on that calculator. I see that mistake a little too often. But it'll spit out your table of options and you can use that as a planning tool. Now, what happens to your retirement should you pass away before retirement? And specifically, this is, this is death, I was going to say on the job, but that's not entirely correct. If you're a public employee still working in the system, compared to if I go to work for Boeing tomorrow, I still get a pension later when I'm 65, but now I'm working in the private sector and I die, right? I die as a public employee. The first thing we will do is calculate 75% of your highest annual salary. That's a lump sum, one time, that's paid out to your beneficiaries. That's not limited to a legal spouse. It's a lump sum, right? So don't hesitate to list non-spouses as beneficiaries of your pension. But Matt, you said only a spouse can get my pension. Well, that is correct, but what if you die before retirement? My spouse is my primary. My kids are my contingent beneficiaries just in case. My wife and I pass away, the kids divide up this lump sum. On top of that, a monthly benefit can be inherited. This is on the back page of that brochure. But it basically says this. If you are legally married and have been for at least six months and you pass away, if qualified, a monthly pension immediately starts to go to your surviving spouse. So what does if qualified mean? Maybe you already qualify to collect the benefit. I'm already 65 with four years. I'm 62 with at least 10. I'm 60 with 20. I've hit my 25 years, right? I could have retired, but I'm still working. I've been married at least six months. I pass away. A full option three starts to go to the spouse. Option three being the largest a spouse can get, right? If if qualified also means, well, shoot, if I, let's pick on Cody. Let's say Cody has 15, 16, 17 years of service now. If you have at least, but he's not old enough to retire, right? If you have at least 15 years of service and you pass away, one third of option three immediately starts to go to the spouse. No early age reduction either. With 15 years in, the death benefit just improved if you're married, right? With 20 years of service or more, but still not old enough to retire, two-thirds of option three immediately starts to go to that surviving spouse. With 25 years or more, it's a full option three. So again, the death benefit under tier one or the tier two hybrid, the death benefit improves for those who are married with at least 15 years in or as soon as you qualify to retire but continue working, right? Anything we need to clarify there? It's, it's a nice benefit. You don't have to tell your spouse if you don't want to. We'll contact them if we need to, right? That's a bad joke. But 
the advice that I like to give here is, <laughs> thank you, <laughs> double check your beneficiaries. And not just that, log into your account, click on manage your profile in the top right hand corner. Manage profile, make sure your marital status is correct. It's your legal spouse that inherits the check whether or not they're listed as a beneficiary, right? When there's an inheritable pension, we're not looking at beneficiaries, we're looking at who is your legal spouse, in this case, at the time of death. And hopefully your, spou your spouse is probably a beneficiary as well, right? So check those two things, beneficiaries and legal status, uh, marital status. It also says a refund of member contributions. If you have some pre-1986 contributory time, you have some member contributions in there, that can also be inherited by anybody. In this case, if you're married and you have member contributions, that legal spouse would choose between a monthly check or a refund of your contribution. So, during retirement, Imagine you're now retired, it's a check every month. We, we're really almost forcing everybody to, to use direct deposit. They started this year charging $20 for every mailed pension check. It's absurd, but obviously they want everyone to just do direct deposit. It's your choice. It's your choice. Oh, it'll cost you $20 for every printed check we mail out. <laughs> Crazy. Um, know, that, uh, know that your first pension checks, when you initially retire, they might take a month or two or at most three months before you get anything. It's retroactive, so at most you'll get three checks at once three months after you retire. But that might mean you need some cash flow when you retire. <laughs> We've talked about taxes a bit. Federal and state income, depending on your primary residence. Annual COLA, two words here, but a big benefit, right? Your pension is not fixed. It's not stationary. As long as we have inflation taking place, every year in retirement, on the anniversary of your retirement date, you'll get a little bit of an increase. That's our attempt to help you combat inflation the longer you live and the higher prices go, right? Pensions that are fixed lose value over time. You understand that as prices go up. Huge benefit. It is a simple COLA. It's not compounding year to year, um, but it is a COLA. Um, just just uh, to give you an idea, we've probably averaged over the last 10 years COLAs in that two a little over 2% range. So plan on getting a raise in retirement. Uh, sometimes we don't have inflation. The last time, if I remember right, was 09. We actually had deflation. So in 2010, when retirees were getting their COLA, there was nothing. The, their benefit didn't go down, but there was a zero COLA because there was not inflation the year before. That's not as common. Now, if you uh, decide to come back into public employment, this is such a hot topic these days, right? What if I come back into public employment after I retire? The rule is still, the safe rule is stay out for at least a year, right? But let's, let's look at that specifically. So what is this? Retirement check is canceled if you come back within a year. The pension is canceled if you come back in a year. It's not canceled. It's put on hold until you retire a second time, until you leave public employment again, right? Um, if you're in a benefited position, you actually start to accrue a second pension benefit. Vesting on that is two years. I, don't, I guess this would be you retire and you regretted retirement. You didn't realize how much health insurance was going to be or, or whatever, right? So you go back to active member status. There is. There are two exceptions to the rule within the year. This is the more common one. Hey, I've been retired at least 60 days, and now I'm going to be a substitute teacher, right? I'm going to be 
I'm going to come back and train the new person. Or, you know what, seasonally they need my help this first year that, that uh, they have my replacement, right? If you've been gone 60 days, you come back part-time basically without benefits, with an income, income limitation of, um, I want to say it went up a little bit, but under $17,000 a year or half of your final average salary, you're part-time, you're back, we're not going to postpone or put on hold your pension check. You just can't have any benefits, right? That's a little loophole for coming back part-time. Or the other exception is, Cody, you ready? Cody runs for mayor. Is it a part-time possession here? A part-time position here in this city? The mayor of Brigham City? Part-time elected. That's what matters, right? You retire, you come back maybe too early, right? If it's part-time and elected, it doesn't matter. You could run for the school board right when you're retiring. You could run for mayor, that's okay, part-time elected. But again, the safe answer is stay out of public employment for at least a year. Go to work in the private sector, go to work for yourself as soon as you retire. It doesn't affect your pension, but coming back into public does. So if you've been out at least a year, that's the safe zone. Maybe, uh, maybe the county hires you back. The usual option that is taken, there are two options. The usual option is, great, I'll keep, I'll keep receiving my pension check. But I understand that the county can't pay into my 401k anymore. They can't pay into retirement at all, right? You're collecting your pension. The employer can't give you more retirement. That's the double dipping debate of eight, nine years ago, right? Again, it's a hot topic. I know we're recording today. Know what the laws are in place when you go to retire. I thought they were going to change in this last legislative session. We'll see if they change in a couple of months. So know what the laws are in place when you do go to retire. Any questions on post-retirement restrictions, re-employment restrictions? Again, go to the private sector if you want. Doesn't affect your benefits. Retire and stay retired. Um, why is this such a hot topic? I feel for, let's give an example of our public safety officers and firefighters, right? A lot of them can retire after 20 years. A lot of them are planning a second career so they can get out of that hazardous career. And, and a lot of them just want to go teach school or, or get a, a regular desk job somewhere in government. Well, these post-retirement restrictions thwart a lot of those plans. That's the main reason I think that we'll see some loosening up of the laws. Okay. All right. So should we pause for a moment? How are we on time, Mariana? We've we've uh, we've hit the hour mark, right? So we're supposed to be starting tier two. So let me take like two minutes, if that's okay, and sum up the savings plans, right? We've been talking about this awesome employer paid benefit, but you should also be saving along the way. Whether or not your employer puts into your 401k, they're, they're, funding, they're funding a nice big benefit already. So we should all be proactive. We should all be saving for our own retirement. The county offers payroll deduction, if I remember right, in all four of these plans. You have tax deferred options and after taxed Roth IRA, right? So um, the happiest retirees I meet with are those who have also been proactive and contributed toward their own retirement. You know, a quick thought on the stock market. Um, everyone feels like we're way overdue for some big correction. That may or may not take place. A um, couple of investing principles. Invest consistently for the long run. Right? Keep your emotions out of this. If the market tanks tomorrow, keep your head, right? How do we make money or lose money in the stock market? The second you pull it out determines whether you made some money or locked in your losses, right? One of the big mistakes in 08 was, hey, I've been buying high in 2007. The market tanks. Oh, crud. I'm pulling out. I bought high. I sold low, right? Locked in my losses. Just Stay the course.
be aggressive while you're young, gradually make it more conservative by the time you retire, and you don't care so much about the ups and downs, and take advantage of payroll deduction. Buying in every month, every two weeks, whatever, through the ups and through the downs, they call that dollar cost averaging, right? Right now, you're getting fewer shares for every contribution than you were a couple of years ago. That's okay. If the market goes down, you keep buying in. Everything's on sale, right? Invest consistently. Keep your emotions out of it. If you can't handle all of that or you just want a hands-off approach, use the target date fund. Let us do it for you. Just throw money at it. We're going to make it conservative over time. We give advice on that one as well. We got to end now, but here are my annual reminders for everybody, which I kind of hit on already. Check your years of service. Make sure your expectations are in line with, with our records, right? Uh, make sure your beneficiaries are up to date. Keep saving. Make, maybe you make it an annual goal, goal to increase what you're saving. And I know we're public employees. I'm a public employee too. We're on tight budgets. Uh, up until a month ago, the smallest Payroll deduction I had seen was $5. About a month ago, I saw somebody contributing $1 a paycheck. That's better than nothing, right? Everybody should be saving. Thanks for your time. We really don't have time for questions because we have tier two to start. But uh, thank you for the questions during the presentation.